Yeah, also from my side, thank you very much for the invitation. Glad that I made it this year. Uh, great course. Um, now, great presentation about technique. Now I take you again on uh, some more thoughts of indication and pathology. And I try to give you some of our ideas when we talk about shoulder pains and when we uh, see athletes, uh, overhead athletes. So this basically, we also have in Germany some pictures. You don't believe it, but this is a 36-year-old guy. Uh, he came to my clinic. And you see he has already gone through a lot of changes. You have the pasta lesion. In you have the internal impingement and a couple of problems he has. And I mean, that's down the road. We don't want to have the athletes end in this situation because then it's always difficult to treat these cases. And uh, thinking about treating overhead athletes over the years, um, we have a long history. Bennett's lesion in the 40s. We had the idea of Nears impingement. We had Job's idea of anterior laxity. Burkhardt uh, and Morgan in the 2000s with the idea of the GERD with Keepler together and the slap lesions. Then we had this area of slap repairs. We've talked about that today. Then Buddy Savoir, the combined treatment and ending up with Tony Romeo's um, comparison of uh, tenodesis versus slap repairs. And you see the success in return to sports for these athletes. And that's not really a story of success. And we know that when we have to deal with a rotator cuff, uh, we really get into trouble. We get 80% back to recreational sports, but we don't get the high-level athletes back to high-level sports, about 50% when we have to really fix a rotator cuff. Um, so what's the problem we are talking about? So we can get, go back to evolution. We think that um, monkeys, they also can throw, and they usually don't have pain when throwing. And there is a reason in there. And you see here this video from uh, the Boston group. Uh, you see this difference in throwing. And when you think about your patients, you also see the difference. Because the old ladies play tennis like this. And this is how the athletes really try to get high velocity throws. And there are two, three reason, main reasons out of the evolution. Um, one thing is that um, the human body is able to twist the core and the monkey is not able to twist the core. So we can store kinetic energy in the whole core and it's like a spring we can release. And we have a lower position of the shoulder, of the shoulder and we have another proportion of the um, scapula which allows us again to have much more rotational force in there. And in the motion of throwing, I believe there are two critical moments. It's a late cooking phase where you have this maximum external rotation and also the release phase, which I think we sometimes forget because when we release the projectile, the arm with the whole kinetic energy has also to be stopped. And this reflects the energy we have in our shoulder joint. There are these two critical moments uh, where you have um, high forces uh, in the moment of late cocking and you have even higher forces in the moment when the projectile is released. There's a bunch of theories out there um, I've shown you before. Um, I think it's, it's, it's no more a question that you believe in one theory and this is right and the other theory is wrong. I think we have to bring these things together and perhaps have a combined approach. So one first thought about this is uh, look at your athletes and think, is it rather a traumatic problem or is it rather an overuse problem? So these classic throwing uh, sports like javelin in our hands, pitching, um, then you have the volleyball players, tennis, tennis players, and then you have the contact athletes and like handball, which is really in between both. And I like this idea um, of grouping them. And I think we have really three types um, to deal with. We have the classic thrower type with the posterior superior impingement or the pathologic posterior superior impingement with this posterior pain. They usually have GERD and they usually have pastor lesions or they end up with pastor lesions. We have the second type. These are kind of uh, the handball guys. Um, they have traumatic instability, perhaps part of it, and out of this traumatic event, they develop this internal instability and the pasta lesions and the slab lesions. And we don't have to forget these um, hyperlexity, swimmer, 
overhead athlete guys, which usually present in a rotator cuff associated pain. They have this problem that their rotator cuff has to work so much to get this um, humeral head centered that they develop the pain out of this and they usually have issues with their core strength and, and these problems. We've looked at uh, athletes, especially these throwing type athletes. We have had the German new junior national team and we observed them and also a junior volleyball team. And we were interested what we see in these athletes with no pathologic problems. They were all healthy athletes training on a high level. And one first thing we saw in there, we saw there was this interesting MRI study because we found this cystic lesion in about 70% of the dominant arms of the javelin throwers. 18 years old guys, no problems with their shoulder, just this. And there's something happening in these athletes. And also we looked at scapular motion, we looked at the range of motion uh, and the isokinetic testing and we found also in this group that they have already a protracted sc uh, scapula, that they have this amount of about 10 degrees skirt in comparison to the other shoulders. So even these young athletes at 18 years, they're already at, at, at risk for developing problems. So what to consider when we treat them or when we analyze them and we came up, we're not the first coming up with this idea, but uh, we kind of packed it together in these five keys. You have to think about the capsule, you have to think about the rotation, the GERD, you have to think about the scapula, you have to think about the local and core stability. The rotator cuff is an issue, and then as we have heard uh, very much about this morning, uh, the biceps and slab lesions play a role. And we, my workup kind of looks at all this, and this is this glenoid internal rotation def deficit, the GERD. It's debated very much, but I have a lot of patients presenting with that problem, and you can easily check that. And here you see this cadaver model where the infraspinatus is torn in the moment where they release the projectile, and perhaps it's rather more like a shortened or contracted infraspinatus rather than really a capsular problem, which also explains that in most cases it's an easy stretching thing, you can release that. And what happens when you have this contracted capsule or the infraspinatus, you see this is the normal joint, capsule is same tension and it centers. And when you have this contracted posterior capsule, then you get this decentration of the humeral head. The humeral head goes superior and your cuff has to work against that. This has also been shown biomechanically um, that there is um, with 10% GERD and significantly more really you have a problem with centering your humeral head. And this is this cascade all of the theory, theories are talking about. Like we have an internal impingement with this, which is not pathologic. We have heard it before in the great talk. Uh, but now you have this decentration of the humeral head and then you get down this cascade and this might end up in a rotator cuff lesion, which is disastrous for the patients. And here you see the video in this moment when it's a pathologic impingement and you see that you already start with the partial articulated sided tears. This is also perhaps a reason that you don't, well, you have to be sure that you don't fix these rotator cuffs too much medial. You really have to give these throwers the space they create with the rotator cuff to not make them more problematic. And it's not really um, shown, but there's a lot of tendency in the literature and the overview works or the review works that this is a correlation to problems with the shoulder. Second part is the scapula. You see the scapular position. I will skip that because we'll have two talks about the scapula later on. But this also has a correlation to problems with the athletes when you see the scapular dyskinesia. And now it's putting things together because there is this study out there which showed that when you have fatigue training of your infraspinatus and fatigue training of the external rotators, this ends up in scapular dyskinesia. So there's always this, like there's this 50 year old tennis player coming to you, telling you, oh, I've started playing tennis again three months and now my shoulder hurts. And he has the scapular dyskinesia and this pain in his rotator cuff. And perhaps it's because he overloaded it, then he ended up with the dyskinesia in that moment. And this kind of continued then with his problems. And 
the rotator cuff and an external rotation strength is also a very interesting part as a risk factor for these athletes. So insufficient external rotation strength has been shown in a couple of studies that these patients or these athletes have a higher risk of injuries to their shoulder. And the last thing I want to show you about this topic is again, that when you go over the fatigue of your external rotators, you have a decentration of the humeral head again. So we have to train these athletes that they have a good rotational strength and that this rotational strength is good for the long time and that they are able to resist the fatigue. Um, sensor motoric function, we've looked at some um, patients after surgery, successful surgery, so sensor motoric function of the rotator cuff really is an issue and when you work them up, you should have an eye on that and we can adapt to the trainings we know from the lower limb and we can really uh, have nice training programs out of this. And then for the athletes with shoulder pain, I take a look at their core stability and core function and I use this single leg uh, um, test. Um, which is really great when you let them uh, do a single leg squat. This uh, on the upper right is a young pitcher as well. And you see how their core is unfunctional. You really have an, an, an idea where you can train. I've trained a swimmer girl, 14 years old, no pathology in their shoulder, shoulder pain when swimming. And we just only did core training. It took us five months, but when, then we got her back. So this is because the trunk and the whole kinetic chain is important and you need a good core for that. Here's this picture I showed you in the beginning. You see this maximal girt he had. You see the scapular dyskinesia in his right shoulder. And you see his core instability when he's doing the squats. So there's a lot you can work up with your conservative training. And then you can adapt this to the problems you have, stretching, pectoralis, training scapula, um, and the external rotators and the core. Well, do we have a chance to prevent that? So we don't want to have the athletes back to, um, to a physiologic um, or the anatomy. Uh, we want to have them back to their function. So keep them on the edge. Don't try to make them normal shoulders. And when we address a prevention program um, to this, which we did with our javelin athletes, then you have perhaps a good chance to prevent further problems with their shoulders. And it has already been shown uh, from the Nordic societies that these preventions help. And this is a very nice homepage. You can see a lot of um, movies for prevention training um, from the Oslo Trauma Center. Um, they did a great work with that. And it's been shown that with handball players, 600 players, when we address these points, which we talked about, then we have a chance to reduce the risk of injury. And also, like the uh, American uh, AOSSM, um, if you reduce the impact, especially on young patients, then you can also reduce the problems of the shoulder. So prevention, this is a lady, handball player, she was a medical student, uh, played handball since she was at the age of six. She presented with this internal rotation deficit, no structural problem. She just went to stretching and after one year she sent me this email, kind of, I just did stretching. Uh, she had two years issue with her shoulder and other guys already told her, you need a supracromial decompression and you can never play handball again. And it was just a question of getting her shoulder in the right um, stretching mode. And this is um, a tennis player, young tennis player. Um, we kept him with, um, with conservative treatment, but you see he already have this uh, light micro instability in front, which you see in the MRI and uh, slight lesion of the rotator cuff, should, so he's really on the edge. Um, another guy, volleyball player, 22 years. First, I started conservatively with, with him. Then he told me six months ago, I had a, a fall and a trauma in snowboarding. And he had a, um, an instability and a traumatic instability. And then, of course, I believe that you fix this instability because this is a morphological problem. And I addressed the biceps. In his case, I did a tenodesis. Um, and, and then you get good results. And also this uh, young lady, she was a tennis player. Um, she had a micro instability, hyperlaxity, multidirectional, uh, conservative training failed for three years. And in her situation, we went in there for a 270 capsule repair, and then we got her head centered again, and she was able to get back to sports. And here again, a traumatic handball player where we fix the labrum when it's um, after luxation damaged. 
So we looked a little bit because it's a mixed bag. It's difficult um, for with our Munich group, some patients. We looked how where we did this combined treatment, but it's really hard to fix them together. So in the end, really, I think when we're talking about athletes, it's not just talking about slap. It's not just talking about one thing. It's really trying to get these things together. Our five keys kind of perhaps help to, to, to reconsider and have in mind which areas to check. Um, combined treatment, I truly believe, and the conservative treatment is really the focus. And we have to do prevention. I think uh, there's no need that we lose um, our young patients with the problems and keep them on the edge and don't let them fall. Thank you very much. Thank you.